I'm excited to introduce to you Deborah Shane and Angie Shawikarath of The World Behind the World. Thank you. Thanks for having us. <laughs> so we're going to switch it up a little bit. Uh, we are going to, rather than do individual artist talks, we're going to ask each other questions in kind of like an interview style. So I'm going to start by asking Angie some questions. <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit about the title and how the title of our show relates to your work? Sure. Um, so, The World Behind the World. Uh, it's kind of, for me, this idea that um, there's more going on than we see just on the surface of things with people, especially. You know, you have your everyday workload or you meet people, um, maybe at your kid's school or something, and they, they don't really know who you are. You're like, you, you're a mom, you're whatever. They don't know all these other things. They might not even know you're an artist. Artists have a very different way of looking at the world. If you start kind of digging at them and asking, and then they're like, oh yeah, I think kind of weird things. So a lot of the, um, well, like half of the, paintings that I have in the show, uh, there's elements that come from dreams. So that's kind of like this other world too. Everybody's got like a, you know, subconscious, unconscious life. And then how that all fits in, a lot of it is emotions. So that's also another kind of hidden world. And just the way you see things, you know, you see things maybe through color, texture, whatever. Right. Well, that is a great headway to, um, into your process, and if you could talk a little bit about um, your choice of materials. And... Uh, so I've been a painter for almost 30 years. I started oil painting uh, at Colorado College, and that's mainly what I've been doing all along. I, what I've been wanting to do, uh, last summer I had to show all landscapes. I kind of started doing landscapes about eight years ago, seven years ago, and just got into that, traveling places, which is another thing I love to do. Um, but I wanted to get back to doing figures. I used to go to Cottonwood to their life drawing every Friday uh, down in the old building. And so I had all these charcoal sketches, and, and I always thought I wanted to make paintings of them. I thought, you know, they need like the context background. So I started thinking about putting them with the landscape and then trying to make things more personal. And that's where the dreams came in. Uh, and just kind of relating to the colors, kind of visualizing what it would be like, you know, when you're doing like a landscape, you know, from life or from photographs, you have something you're referencing right there in front of you. You just keep checking it all the time. And with this project, it, it was really difficult. I don't usually work that way, just from my imagination. Um, so it was, it was a lot of different things, you know, combining this and like the charcoal sketches. I used some photos for some of the uh, backgrounds, like the Aspen Forest. That's a series of photos I took up off of the Gold Camp Road. Mm -hmm. And it, it's challenging, and sometimes it would make me crazy. So <laughs> I started thinking about this relationship you have with the, with the work of art. And you know, you start doing it, you're excited. It's kind of like having a relationship, you know? You're like, you're starting, you're dating somebody. You're like, oh, I'm really excited about this idea. I'm excited about this. Whatever, and you start putting it on a canvas or a panel, and you, you get pretty excited. And then, as you go after a while, you know, you get kind of bogged down. You're like, ah, I don't know if this is working for me. And sometimes it's really hard, and you want to quit, like a relationship. <laughs> um, and I have had that with some of these paintings, and I just get to a point. It's like I've been working on this a long time, and I just not right and I don't know what to do to fix it you know and you have like a few days like that and then you sleep on it and 
hopefully you come up with something. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, if you're lucky, something switches and you're like, oh, this is, this is what I wanted to do. This is what I like. I like these colors. I like that, um, you know, that brush stroke. And then it kind of comes together and pretty soon it's like, yeah, I think this is close to done. Now it's done and you, you're sort of falling in love with it at that point. Well, you know, I, it's interesting hearing you talk about how you're in love with it at first and then you kind of get a little tired of it. It's kind of like this roller coaster going back and forth and love to hate relationship. Um, and I know being both artists, it, there's that inspiration aspect, finding inspiration for your work. And I don't know if you could talk a little bit about some artists that inspire you, and maybe do you like enlist these the artists during those times in between? Do I talk to them? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of getting away from that. I, I can tell you though, uh, when I was in high school, and I started taking a lot of art classes in the school, uh, there were some really good art teachers, and I liked very realistic artists. Andrew Wyeth was one of my favorites. And then I kind of dropped him. I don't know, maybe listening to other people, he wasn't popular for a while. And, but I saw his show in Denver a few years ago, and it was great. It just, and what I like about it, it isn't that it's like so realistic looking, which is pretty realistic. But it's the mood and the feeling that he gets from his uh, his palette, his uh, the way he uses the paint. Uh, sometimes it's the size of the piece. You know, you would do something. Some things are better in small format. Some things larger. Um, I like the impressions a lot, um, especially when I was starting oil painting. But I, I kind of stuck with that a lot. Like Cezanne is one of my favorites. So. And it, it must be exciting to like have this love, you know, this interest in an artist and be inspired in high school, and then later in your life come and see a show. You said you saw it a few years ago. And that's incredible. Like, I would have been so excited. <laughs> it was a big show. It was him and his son. And wife was dead, of course. But it was it was works of his son and then his son Jamie. Works of his and his son Jamie. Some of it in the same places because they, they live in New England mm -hmm. and just have two different people, different generations, but you know, it's amazing, similar and different. Yeah, that's amazing. How has COVID affected your practice? <laughs> you had that. Yeah. In a way, it hasn't affected it very much because I like to keep to myself a lot. I'm kind of a loner, I spend a lot of time alone. My studio's in my house. I like it that way. Uh, I've had more time alone because I, I'm not working anymore. I worked at the Fine Arts Center and when it closed, I didn't have a job because my job was, uh, it's patron experience guide, it's a security, uh, gallery helper, um, and since they were closed, they didn't need any people like that. So I had a lot of time uninterrupted. But you know, there was a lot of anxiety. There is still a lot of anxiety. What's going to happen? In the beginning, it was like, I can't concentrate on this painting or this drawing because I'm almost out of toilet paper, you know? Yeah. Whatever. And and you hear different things you didn't know. You need to wear a mask, what kind of mask, what, what do people do when everybody had it? So I think there's something in the atmosphere when everybody's kind of experiencing all this anxiety. It's just kind of floating around. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a painting that I did want to talk about. I really think your Green Lady painting is very interesting. And in your statement, you talked a lot about the dignity um, to womanhood. Can you talk a little bit about how that this is one of my art? <laughs> okay, um, so that painting, actually, that um, the dignity of womanhood, actually, I wrote that in relation to this painting, the shards. Um, 
Um, but I guess you could apply to that too. A lot of these paintings have women figures in them. Yeah. Uh, the Green Lane painting, um, well, all the paintings really. I mean, I started with this idea that um, they, these are my own telling or retelling or a translation of uh, mythology, gods, goddesses, angels, heroes, heroines, who, I don't know, I, I picked them because I thought they were something that people could connect to on just like a surface level. Maybe they know who Marilyn Monroe is, or they know who uh, Little Red Riding Hood is. But then from there, it's their own entry into whatever. The Green Lady is, I don't think that's a real character. I, I think maybe it's very kind of rare. Like the Green Man is a kind of British folklore character. Um, you'll see him like in carvings in churches, and he has like this kind of tenderly beard and hair and horns, and he looks like he's made of plants. Uh, he represents different things. I think he's kind of like a wild guy, but also representing the earth and nature. Uh, that we're caretakers for the earth. Um, but I thought there's enough paintings of the Green Man. I wanted this woman character, and she's linked to him. Uh, just kind of laying there like she's waiting for him. And he's turned into a tree or something. But she's waiting there, and she's watching the forest. Uh, kind of benevolent. Uh, warm character, um, you know, in tune with nature. And I think that's the concept that a lot of women can get behind because it's like you're kind of the nurturing part of the family, the other family. Well, I also, um, now that you brought up Marilyn Monroe, maybe you can um, talk a little bit about her. Uh, I don't think I know very much about Marilyn Monroe and Norma Jean, and as far as I, I grew up with them being, you know, her being an iconic figure, of course, but I, I grew up remembering her as very sexualized um, and, um, you know, pushing the boundaries of, of what womanhood was in, in many ways. So I don't know if you could talk a little bit about uh, the, your choice and Sure. These two paintings uh, are the idea of between one that's Marilyn Monroe and one that's the pre-Marilyn Monroe, Norma Jean. That was one of the first ideas I came up with on my idea list of what characters I wanted to paint. I've always loved Marilyn Monroe and just really, I don't want to say related to her, but you know, this vulnerability, this, um, yeah, people see her as this bombshell, but she was many things, you know, she was, she was a very funny comedian, uh, comedian, comedian actress, really, she didn't tell jokes or anything. Uh, but, you know, when you look into her life, she started out, uh, she was born in Los Angeles, and that's where she lived, and her mother um, was, estranged from her husband, and he wasn't her father, so she never knew her father. Her mother uh, had a lot of uh, mental problems, I guess. She was in and out of institutions, so Marilyn was put into foster care at a very early age, or had, you know, friends take care of, take care of her, uh, very unstable. Um, she was sexually molested as a child by at least one of these people in this kind of foster in and out thing. Um, she got married when she was 16, and that was mainly just to kind of get out of all that. Um, but to me, it's like these are kind of like she's symbolizing something else, too. You know, this idea of like this blonde 
you know, so silvery, so cool, you know, it's like the moon, everybody looks up, you know, the full moon. And then the, the dawn, when just the colors, you know, like first thing in the morning, you're so excited like a child or something like that. Uh, well, something I think a lot about with the, the people of these paintings is um, just how there's this performative quality in our everyday lives. And it's like you wake up and you're like this natural, normal human baby and you go out in the world and you kind of have this performance. I mean, oh, we all do it. You kind of have this performance of what you're feeling for that day, whether it be when you're picking up your kids at school or when your job, it's, it's a performative quality. And I, I really connect to both of these in that, you know, I feel like she's in a performance here and that's just part of her life and it's kind of something you accept. And, but then she can go home and, you know, still be grounded and, you know, kind of in touch with who she is. And, you know, sometimes it can be, <laughs> Oh, her story is very interesting in that it's very dramatic and, um, and traumatic, actually. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it was interesting that you did a, two versions of Marilyn Monroe. Well, that's the best if you can have your outside world where you put on your strong face or whatever you're feeling, and then you go home and just be yourself and not have all that other right. worries or whatever. Uh, yeah, right. Well, speaking of, of um, different faces and performances, um, I was curious about your um, Stella and Oaks painting. I, um, I think it's interesting that you painted her, I mean, you're, you're tapping into the, the figure and um, just this history of women being depicted, um, you know, through a new forum, but at the same time, you have this posture with her that is very confident and she's thoughtful and she's in a relaxed position and she's surrounded by books. And I we could talk a little more about. Sure. Uh, what I was trying to do, and I'm kind of, some of these others are like that too. I'm trying to tap into something that's like very historical, classical. Uh, They have these ancient figures, you know, um, symbols, and they were like kind of like goddesses in the morning. Of course, I started because I had a sketch of a model like that, and I just really liked the pose. I liked the expression on her face, and I thought, what would be a good setting for that? And I liked the idea. I love books, and I liked that. What would you like to do if you had a lot of time and you didn't have to do stuff? I would read a lot of books. You know, and I would sit around in the library and without any clothes on. But, yeah, she could do that. Yeah, it's not supposed to be like modern personal book. It could be anything. That's that's the cool thing about a lot of uh, uh, classical art. It could be a different time. It's the clothing that puts you in a certain period. These are, those three are all watercolors, and that's, uh, that's kind of your thing for me to be doing, trying to like see how, how that intersects with the oil painting. Right. It's really a different Would you get You know, I like it. I like the freedom of it, and you have to just kind of go with the freedom of it and not. It's, fr it's frustrating though, because you can have something like, oh, I really like that part, and you could have put more paint on it or a drop of water, and then it just disappears. It runs together. Mm -hmm. You can't paint over it as easily like oil paint. You can paint over it and over it and scrape it off. But painting on these panels and then a canvas too um, is different than paper. You can, you can lift off the colors more easily if you make a mistake and come back to white. And that's why I didn't think about painting on paper. You have to think so much ahead. You can't just be spontaneous because you're like, oh, I painted all that. I wanted that all white. Right. So it is completely different yeah. animal in a way. Yeah. <laughs> the, the hardest part of these was uh, varnishing them. I didn't want to put it under glass. I like the look of watercolor, but watercolor, I don't know, 
people know that it isn't uh, permanent. You know, you can have it totally dry and water can or humidity or anything like that. So it's not that common to uh, to do them without glass. So I've done a lot of research and just trying to find things. So, I don't know, I'm gonna keep looking at that. The thing I didn't like is that you spray and you paint this stuff, it's very toxic, harsh fumes, I like to do something. Uh, so not so stinky. Yeah, yeah. Well, can I ask one more question about your paintings? Um, I'm curious about your red riding hood painting. And there's like 40 versions of Red Riding Hood. I didn't know that. Is that all? <laughs> <laughs> and what I think is interesting that what is consistent about all 40 of them is that the wolf is the antagonist. And I'm curious about your 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 animals, your wolf friends um, in your painting. You know that is interesting. Um, so I I always thought she is the victim in this story. And I'm trying to show that you don't need to be a victim, be strong, however that means. So to change her, yeah, I did some research on her. Uh, and some of my earlier ideas, she was the she was the one, you know, inflicting the damage on the wolf, you know. And I just, I didn't feel right about that. I didn't want to have, um, have it be violent. So to me, anyway, that scene is, is uh, kind of peaceful coming together. And these uh, characters, these dogs or wolves and the wolf man, uh, they love her just like your dog loves you. Uh, they look to her, she's like the, a higher spirit in the woods. And they see her coming and they just kind of look. They don't say, oh, here she comes, let's eat her. You know? mm -hmm. uh, so she's got this innocence, but this worldly, I don't know. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, she's got her. How does the title of this show uh, apply to her art? What were your inspirations? Okay. Well, one thing I really appreciate is our correspondence throughout the past few months, going back and forth and kind of bouncing ideas for the title of the show. And I think that was really important, I think, because you and I were able to learn more about each other's work and really hone in on, like, the perfect title. And I wasn't expecting the last correspondence we had, you sent all these, these titles and the world behind the world was in it. And I was like, this, it resonated with me. Um, a lot, kind of what you said as far as like there's this world that exists behind another world and for me, I felt like I was doing work that was um, touching base on a, a opposite of masculine versus femininity and um, public spaces versus private spaces and fine art versus craft and this there was always this world behind this more dominant world, and so I think a lot of my work was, um, is exploring that, and so I think that's why the, the title just right away, I was like, that's it, I'm emailing at you back, and we're gonna, you know, see what we can do with this. I think so, you just really hooked on that. We had some other titles we were kind of tossing around, and I don't think people realize that we didn't know each other this great collaboration at all. Abby kind of saw a similarity and took this up together. Amazing. And then you have to kind of like get to know the other person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, worked out well. It did. I have to agree. So, um, would you say that you have a style? Oh, definitely. Because you do. I definitely have a style. style. Yeah. Um, yeah. Metal and yeah. <laughs> things that are just yeah. right. Well, and the scars. Right. Well, it's funny because I don't think much about having a style. I just and then when someone asks me that, I'm like, oh, I I, I do have a style. Um, I was born in the '70s, and so 
when I started studying art, and I really I love art history, and I found myself gravi gravitating towards um, the 60s and 70s movements of minimalism, post-minimalism, conceptual art. And so, I mean, I love the um, geometric shapes of Ellsworth Kelly and Donald Judd, but I love the, and Sol Lequit, um, and I love the organic um, sculptures that are made by Eva Hess, and she used a lot of industrial materials for her sculptures. I love the experimental weavings of Sheila Hicks and, um, gosh, conceptual art of Meryl Latterman Ukulees, who she went out and did an um, artist residency in New York where she worked in the sanitation department for an entire year and documented her, her studies through the sanitation department and she tied it to domesticity. And it was amazing. So there was a performance art happening there. So I just, I could go on and on. I mean, I have so many inspirations, but I think I definitely gravitate towards minimalism, post-minimalism, and um, conceptual art. So yeah. Where do you get the ideas for these art pieces, I, I don't know if you can say that in one sentence, but um, say, say things behind it. Where did you get that idea? Was it the materials first, or was it like the... Right. Well, a, a big part of my process is, um, is, is research. I mean, I think I probably do more research than actually making work. And I think that through research I get inspiration. And these, um, I used to, I was calling them corner caps for the longest time, and they were inspired by turn of the century um, bean caps. So inside homes they had exposed beans, and they would do these steel bean caps that would give extra support to the beans. But over time they started using them as decorations, and so I thought it'd be kind of interesting to make corner caps um, because in a way it kind of relates to the title of the show. It's like taking two walls, two messages or two structures and bringing them together. And so I feel like they join those two ideas together. Uh, so I think that's where I got the idea of doing a corner cap. I thought it was kind of funny too. I was like, what is this supporting? <laughs> two walls that exist. Um, and I, I thought, I felt that way about the bean caps with the, uh, turn of the century bean caps, I thought it was kind of funny. I was like, what, could the beans should be the support. Why do we need these steel caps? But anyway, so that's what launched the idea for this piece. But I really wanted um, to talk about, like, there's this structure that supports, there's this supportive structure, and that typically being more of a dominant structure, and I wanted to bring some something softer in there that's also just as important and equally dominant, and that's the feminine features of a home or of a life. And so I really wanted to bring fiber in to, you know, pair that together and kind of bring them to equal planes. And so, yeah. You know, it's funny, when I decided to work with steel and fiber and pair them together, I thought I was pairing polar opposites. Um, of course, because of the history of steel being tied to industrialism and masculine trades, and then you have the feminine, you know, that you know, fibers that tie up, you know, domestic, domesticity and decorative art, and um, tends to be a softer um, material. But what I found really interesting is, as I was working with steel, I was surprised to find out that there is. It's a feminine material in many ways, because when you start out with steel, it's um, it's stiff and difficult to work with and hard to bend and shape. So you have to heat it up a little bit, and you can't heat it up too much because it'll compromise the integrity of the structure. But you can't use just a little bit of heat because then it'll half-ass you. <laughs> you know, it'll, it won't bring you to what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and so you have to kind of spend time with it and talk nice to it. <laughs> and in a way, I feel like there's a lot of feminine qualities in that, where it's, you know, you have to spend time with the material. And then if you do, when you commit to it, beautiful things come out of it, surprising things. And 
So I, I was surprised here on working with materials thinking they're opposites when really there was a lot of similarities that was finding the materials. And I thought that was interesting. So where do you do your work? The steel sculptures I do at, a, my, at my work, um, my day job up in is working for a metal studio in Monument, and so I create the pieces there and um, weld them together and clean them up, and, and then I come home and I work in my home studio and work on the fiber pieces, so I'm able to kind of do, bring them together um, separately. Do you ever find when you bring them home and you start doing the, like the weaving, that table, uh, the table talk, uh, that you want to do more welding on it and then you have to take it back? Or? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I've, I've transported steel work when I get home and then I see a different light. So light in the studio, at, at the welding studio isn't the same as light in my studio. So I get home and I'm like, oh, I might want to, you know, do something different or change something and I'll take it back up. And so, yeah, did a lot of back and forth with that. Sure. About the title. The title of that one is Table Talk mm -hmm. and Occasional Date Night. And an occasional Date Night. Yeah. Right? So I was looking on your website. You had another sculpture from a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Date Night Work Well We Chickens Red Light. It was like, there's Date Night. It's in both of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the piece that you're talking about, it's made from um, chicken wire and steel and fiber and shredded clothing, and I think there's like this brilliant red loofah in the middle. And uh, for that, that piece, um, it was just talking about family and all the things that go into just getting a date night out. That's what get away from the kids. The craziness, you know, yeah. and just the house and, and the responsibilities, paying bills and, you know, just kind of disconnecting as a couple. Um, so that piece was mostly like that, um, about that. Now, Table Talk is about dinner with family and the spontaneous conversations that occur at the table and um, the differing social positions that come to the table. And that piece started out as a flat sheet of steel and it caught my eye. It was actually the trash at work. And I loved the openings that were cut out of it. And I instantly thought those are automatic looms right there. And so I took it into the studio and I tried to bend it and work with it and uh, that was not easy. <laughs> but I was able to get it, I wanted it into a circular form. I wanted it to be almost like a tabletop height in a way. And um, you know, tapped it and then welded it, welded it shut and took it home. And then I got it home and had to figure out how to do the loom part. Which I was looking inside of it to see how all the little yeah. uh, warps are fixed in there. And yeah, that was a problem. Actually. It was. I, you know, I don't know. I'm sure everyone does this. They have this idea in their mind of what, how something's going to turn out, and then you get home and you're like, "There's no way I can do this." And so I had to build the loom system right inside each piece. And um, once I got that figured out, it, then I started weaving it and. It did, it made me think a lot about placemats at the table. And so each piece is kind of like an unfinished conversation, you know? And, um, and spontaneous conversation, unexpected conversations. But I also wanted to leave some openness in that piece, an air, you know, because that's kind of like how dinner is in our family, is there's this, okay, we're sitting down at a table and anything goes, right? <laughs> we're gonna have any conversation. But we're also going to have some openness and respect for each other, and so that's why I wanted there to be some open spaces within that piece. I love it. Thank you. Thanks. But that also shows that, you know, there's more to making art than, you know, oh, we have this idea and it's all kind of like breathing up in the air. You have to construct things. Even a painting, you have to know how something is constructed. There is a that's part of the work, right? Yeah. And experimentation on my part. I mean, I, I think most of my work research-based, but also experimentation. And a lot of it in intuition. A lot of intuition goes into a lot of my work. So you don't know how it's going to be until you actually start putting it out there. Right. Um, 
getting back to this thing, like, you know, with the family, trying to maintain your art practice mm -hmm. while you're also working, also, you know, family obligations. Uh, the, the Deborah's project, um, it seems very playful. I watched the video many, many times. <laughs> um, but it, it seems to me, I mean, if I were you, had all these things, obligations, it's frustration. Um, and then the red stars. I mean, red to me symbolizes lots of things. You know, it's a loaded color, you know, mm -hmm. anger, uh, bloodshed. Mm -hmm. It's a symbol for a lot of, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, is that part of what you have going in the Devers Project, or is that not? It's just you like red. <laughs> well, it does happen to be my. But that's just coincidence. <laughs> um, I don't know if the Deborah's project was necessarily created out of frustration, but more out of necessity. Um, it was created about three years ago, and I was dealing. I think it became kind of like a tiny intervention for me. <laughs> um, I was very busy at the time. I was juggling big motherhood, and going to school, and having a job, and. Um, and so it kind of was one of those things where I wish I could be in multiple places at one time. And at the same time, I was taking a temporary public art class at UCCS, and I had a professor that was um, tremendously influential in the way I viewed art and um, helped me change the way art could be for me. And so temporary public art was one of those things where he encouraged me to explore this busy time in my life and um, how can I put it into an art piece. And so, um, as crazy as it sounded, he encouraged me to enlist other people to go out and be me and send them out on assignments. And so um, now we're like three years into the project and we have multiple Deborahs out at one time sharing experiences. And so it's been a fun project and there's been a lot of different phases. Um, and it's been an experimental project as well. Each, each phase has been different. Um, as far as for the red scars, um, I wanted some consistency. You know, like a painting, you kind of think about consistency throughout your composition. And I felt like sending Deborah's out into the community, they became forms and shape in a painting in a way. And so the scarf became this consistency throughout the piece. Uh, the color red, though, was inspired by the lipstick effect. I don't know if you're familiar with the lipstick effect, but it is, yeah, it's, um, it's the idea of when you adorn yourself with something red, you feel empowered. And it, it, there's a whole marketing scheme um, that has been put towards women in their products and lipstick, the red lipstick, feeling empowered, and you take on this new persona, you might do things, you know, differently if you're wearing a red dress versus your red everyday suit, you know. So this, the color of the scarves were inspired by that study because there's actually science behind it. That um, even men wear power suits and they wear a red tie, and um, so there's a lot of significance in in the fact that they're, you know you're wearing it around your neck and kind of is connecting the, the mind and the body together. And there's a lot of um, there's a lot of stuff in that, in that project. I could go on and on. Um, no, that's interesting. I really like that about the new studio deck. I hadn't really connected that with this. I just thought, well, the scarf that's kind of like maybe 50s or something, that kind of like ready 20th century, right. you know. <laughs> it's a timeless item, really. I mean, if you think about it, it's been used in wars, you know, um, to empower troops to go out and fight. Um, I wanted something also that men can connect with, so it could be an ascot, it doesn't just have to be a feminine scarf. Um, but I also think the project forces people maybe to confront some of their own elements within their own identity. I have had a lot of people refuse to be a Deborah because it, it, it appears to be a feminine project. And so I think that's interesting, um, you know? <laughs> but then I've had men 
who are, you know, embracing the project. And so it's, it's good. We've learned a lot about it, from it. With this idea of uh, temporary art, things that aren't going to stand, you know, make a painting, you build it, hopefully, so it will hold together, not peel off the canvas, whatever. But when you're making temporary art, which this performance, it's kind of something that's just at that time, uh, and you have to let it go. Same thing for a, like a sculpture that would sit outside. Um, and it makes me think of Wabi Sabi. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I have to read from this because I don't remember it. Uh, beauty of things imperfect, impermanent, and incomplete, but things modest and humble and unconventional, uh, an aesthetic but also a philosophical concept. Um, it comes from Japan. Uh, the things that I have seen, examples and photos, it's things that have kind of been weather worn. Uh, you know, what do you think? Do you think of that? Something like that is going to be outside, how it will change? Does it bother you if things would change? Well, you're asking somebody who's moved a lot throughout their lives. So, so the temporary aspect of it, it's funny that you're asking me this question. I'm finally, I'm realizing as you're asking this question that I don't know if I am attached to anything material because we've moved so often and we've lost items, pictures have been destroyed, furniture has been destroyed. So I think throughout the years I've, um, when I work with material, I don't necessarily connect to it and that it's going to be in my life forever. It's just a, it's a temporary thing. So maybe that's why I was drawn to temporary public art. I didn't even realize that. It just I'm um, just having that that realization. Um, but for Sunshine, um, being that my day job is working for a large scale public sculpture studio, and a lot of our work, we have to consider the durability of a sculpture when we put it out and whether or not it's going to be able to handle the elements or the wind. And, um, so what I liked about this piece is that I'm actually using materials that are they're already used outside. I mean, every house almost in the city has rain gutters. They're meant for outdoors. And then the materials are mildew, fade-resistant fibers that, were, that are used for outdoor furniture. So they are, it's meant for outdoors. So I, I feel like I've made that piece so it could be outdoors, it doesn't have to be. But it probably won't change. Or it probably won't change too much, we'll find out. We get some pretty extreme weather here. Yeah. This global one, the Moon Geo, those seem like kind of different things. I mean, one thing is inside of another, but they're very different concepts. Geo and Moon? Yeah. So it's a funny story. That was one of the last pieces I made for this show. I wanted to experiment with the different metals, so I thought um, I wanted to, to play around with um, copper coil. And I knew I wanted to weave something. And so, and I wanted to do a circular weave. And um, I started building this up in my studio, not quite sure what it was going to be. My daughter walked in halfway through and she just made a comment. She goes, Oh, that looks like a Geo. And I was like, Oh, and I started doing research on geodes because that's what I do, is just research everything. And um, it turns out that there's a spiritual element to geodes where a lot of people believe that geodes are like the wombs within the earth and that the crystals um, are, you know, protection and provide spiritual growth. And when I read that, I thought a lot about motherhood and it was just how I've, you know, raised my family and I have my children. And so I, I, I thought I liked that idea of geo and womb and how it ties to the earth and, and, and womanhood. So that's where I got that title and how I came up with the idea. No, yeah, that's a really great synchronicity. Thanks. Uh, you know, just a little thing like your daughter is saying that. Yeah. It was meant to be. It was meant to be. <laughs> if you weren't an artist, this is really, what profession would you be in? If I wasn't an artist, what profession would I be in? I, my family makes fun of me because I can't seem to keep plants alive. 
But the weird thing is, the only plants that survive in my house are the really tough ones, the ones that take neglect. Um, so I have like this fake impression that I really am really good at, at plants. But I would, if I were to choose another profession, I would love to be a horticulturist and study like the science of gardening and, and plant management. And I, I, there's, I think that's another life for me. I really do. I think when I retire, I might do something like that. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> All right. How has the has the COVID pandemic changed your life? That's kind of a silly question. Well, know. it's not because I think COVID definitely affects everyone's the way they operate. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily changed the way I make art. It's just changed the materials. Uh, when I was preparing for this show, I had a whole other idea of what would be in the show, and then my resources shut down when COVID happened. And so I had to kind of use materials with my home. So we happened to be getting the rain gutters replaced on our house, and I, why not use rain gutters? And, you know, just kind of had to keep on making work and just not let the fact that COVID was happening impact that my ability to make work. And so. And, and I, you know, I'm fortunate because I, most of my work is from found pieces anyway, found art and materials. Yeah, so. Okay, what was the first concert you ever went to? Well, I guess it was a concert. I went to the Cheyenne Frontier Days with my parents. We lived in Fort Collins, and it's not very far. I was. Be 13 and saw Roy Clark. And the only thing I knew about him is he was on e <laughs> yeah. Nice. I love music, I, but I wouldn't have chosen to listen to Roy Clark. Yeah. How about you? White Lion. It's an 80s glam metal hair band. <laughs> that sounds funny. <laughs> and I was, it was in California. Yeah, and I had some friends who loved the, the band, and that was a first experience for me, so I just went. But if I were to choose a first concert, probably be like Annie Lennox or <laughs> not White <Lion. laughs> Very good. I get to get I get to get yeah. Okay, well, I have a bunch of these uh, this or that questions. Pancakes or waffles? Can I say French toast? <laughs> <laughs> waffles. Because they hold the syrup. Pancakes and waffles are so similar. That's true. I like waffles because they have the little notches in them and it holds the syrup. Me too. Okay. Me too. So you're going to choose waffles? I choose waffles okay. also. Okay. Not, not, the, not the frozen uh, egg Like waffles. Belgian waffles or really deep ones? Uh, no, not necessarily. I make my own waffles. I have a waffle iron. So they're just the regular. Then you know. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. All right, coffee or wine? Wine. Yeah. Yeah. I don't drink coffee hardly at all. I like the smell of it. I like the taste of it actually, but I kind of gave up caffeine many, many years ago. So I wine uh, yeah. How about you? Well, that's a hard question, but I gonna have to say caffeine is my crutch and gets me up in the morning. I know, and I had to make that decision. So surprised. So coffee, yeah. <laughs> um, library or museum? I'm going to complicate things with this question. <laughs> because the library, of the, Con the library of Congress in D.C. also has a museum. So, um, but I do love libraries. And because my practice is research-based, Libraries are becoming extinct. Everybody can look things up That's even more of a reason for me to go. <laughs> what about you? Museum. Museum. Any kind. Art museum, natural history. I like museums. Uh, okay, your turn. Cat or dog? I do like cats, and I have had a couple of cats in my life, but I'm a dog person. Dogs are the best. I agree. Yay, high five. <laughs> East Coast or West Coast? 
I grew up in the East Coast, but I prefer the West Coast. I love that they have more seasons. I didn't know you grew up on the East Coast. I thought you were from California. Interesting. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. I switched it up. <laughs> I, heard East, I heard West Coast, East Coast. Sorry. Grew up in, yes, I grew up in California. Sorry, East, East Coast. <laughs> Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. <laughs> what about you? East Coast or West Coast? West Coast. Yeah. I I think I just like more space. Mm -hmm. I don't like cold weather very much. Uh, yeah. That'll do it. But I, I do like East Coast. Yeah. Um, fiction or nonfiction? Or was it your two best? That's okay. Let's go with that. Nonfiction. I like information. I wish I could read fiction. Like, I wish I could read the Harry Potter series. I've tried so many times. My kids read them, and they're like, telling me how much I'm missing out on it, but I, mm, I don't know if it's my patience. I'm not quite sure. I don't think we would match up on the day because <laughs> I like fiction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, how about morning or evening? Evening. Yeah. Especially the, the little time of dusk, mm -hmm. like, just after the sun goes down, that, that kind of golden, rosy light. Right. Evening. Yeah. And morning, you have to get up too early. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 4 a.m. to be exact. 4 a.m. is your favorite. Yeah. It's the time I can get things done. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Rain or snow? Rain, definitely. Yeah? I mean, I like to be inside where it's warm and watch the snow a little bit, but I don't like cold weather, I don't ski, I don't, I don't like... It's amazing you and I compare together. It really is. <laughs> I grew up in northern Iowa, and they got a lot of snow. Mm -hmm. And the way it would snow there when I was a kid, the snow you would get in November was there in May, mm -hmm. whenever it started melting. It just would get hard. You could walk on top of the snow. You just kind of get used to it. I didn't really know any better. Even yeah. now that I know better. Rain. You know? Rain? No. Oh. I'm snow. I love the snow. <laughs> I think I knew that. <laughs> okay, 50s or 80s music? I'm going to say 50s music. That was kind of something. Uh, when I was in high school, I started really getting into 50s music. And this was like late 70s, I was in high school. I graduated in 1981. Uh, and I got into Buddy Holly, uh, a lot of 50s stuff. 80s, yeah, I was the right age for that. I was into some of that 80s stuff. But 50s, I still really love it. And you can tell how influential it was to all the rock musicians who came out. Yeah, yeah. And I like the 50s style for a while, like big skirts. Uh, yeah. I'm definitely 80s. <laughs> 80s music for sure. Did you have the big hair? I did. I had the flamingo bangs. And... <laughs> <laughs> Is that what <laughs> Circles or squares? Squares. Circles. <laughs> Why squares? It might be tied to the minimalistic square that I am drawn to. Yeah. I don't know why. That, that's the only answer I have. <laughs> Theater or cinema? Um, I, like, I like both, but I think cinema more. Mm -hmm. I just, I really love movies, especially old movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Cinema. Yay! Oh! That's <laughs> too. Yeah. Now, I grew up with my parents taking us to dinner theater, but my dad was also a movie buff, so I got both worlds, but I really like the special effects of cinema. So, oh, there you go. Very good. Uh, that's it. Oh, I got one. Yeah. Ocean or mountains? Well, I grew up around the ocean, um, but I, my heart's in mountains. I love just endless trails. I love it. Yeah. It's a good thing you came here. I know. Well, I'm here for good. <laughs> yeah. What about you? Um, ocean. Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> but I do love the mountains. You know, when I 
go away from Colorado, you know, and drive back, you get to Lyman, and you just, all of a sudden, I see the mountains, and you, you kind of miss them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I've lived in Colorado such a long time. Long, long time. Yeah. It's very nice to meet you. You too. Yes. Thank you for sharing this show with me. And real quick, I want, we are, we want to say thank you so much. Thank you so much, Abby. You are just making everything happen, and you're making you're making art happen during this crazy time, and you're making artists feel more you know relevant, and you're reminding us that we need to keep on making this. Thank you. Thank you guys yeah. very much. Yeah. Thank you for joining us tonight.